Gary Young is an incredible inspiration to young black journalists, often who don't see themselves represented in the industry. It has often been said that Gary writes on behalf of the powerless. In a society in a world with extreme levels of socio-economic inequality, his intelligent, thoughtful words are a deeply necessary relief for those of us frustrated with many aspects of our current political system today. So without further ado, join me in giving Gary a warm welcome to the stage. So this may be too loud for you, but it's just right. It's too loud for me. Um, thank you, uh, Alas, such a generous um, <clears throat> introduction. I was thinking about what uh, I would say tonight and and I thought it's it's possible and it's what well, could I do be beneficial to simply just make the case for um, a more diverse media on the merits of the diversity itself um, and to make arguments about um, who has power, who has voice, and so on. But instead I thought I'd do it just through, it, through illustration, and through illustration, uh, some of the stuff that I've seen in my uh, work and the things I've been concentrating on over the last four or five years. Because our understanding of what constitutes news is supposed to be self-explanatory, and the most widely known uh, aphorism for what constitutes a story that I know of is that when a dog bites a man, that's not news because it happens so often, but if a man bites a dog, then that's news. And news is something that, you know, we don't see that often. And in some of the work I've done over the last, particularly over the last six or seven years, I've wondered if there might not be an addendum to that adage. A qualifying footnote to what seems like the obvious, because sometimes, events derive their potential news value, I think, precisely because they happen so often. That there are things that happen with such regularity and predictability that journalists have simply ceased to recognize their news value, not least if those things are least likely to happen to the people who are most likely to become journalists. That sometimes there is value in asking, why do dogs keep biting people? Who owns these dogs? And why do the same people keep being bitten. Now I want to illustrate that point with some examples from my most recent book, which was uh, uh, called Another Day in the Death of America, and a series I ran for a year and a half for The Guardian called Beyond the Blade, which was about knife crime. Now the book is premised on the fact that every day, on average, in America, seven children or teens are shot dead. And that's a reliable statistic. You you, you, you can pick the day, and the kids will die. And so I picked a day at random, you pick a different day, you get a different book. And then I set out over the next two years trying to find out who these kids were, seeking everyone from parents and pastors and basketball coaches and whatnot. And there were 10 kids were shot dead on that day across the country, and the youngest was nine and the eldest was just a few days shy of his 20th birthday. The journalistic series for The Guardian, Beyond the Blade, set out to cover a similar cohort, people who were 19 and under, but a different tragedy. All the children and teens killed by knives. And we mapped the number of children who were killed, and we looked at the themes that emerged. Now, being a journalist, you want to start with the, the facts, or rather the things we know. And I'm always reminded of a, a, a line in the biography of the Harlem Renaissance writer Zora Neale Hurston by a woman called Valerie Boyd, when she explains why it was so difficult to track Zora Neale Hurston's whereabouts in the early 20s. And she says, in 1911, it was relatively easy for someone particularly a black woman, to evade history's recording gaze. If not legally linked to a man as a daughter or wife, black women didn't count. 
in some ways, at least to the people who did the official counting. And that issue of counting, the question of who counts and whom is counted, isn't just a matter of numbers. It's about power. Collecting information, particularly about people, demands both the authority to gather the data and the capacity to keep and transmit it. And those who have both the authority and the capacity need to feel that those they are keeping tabs on matter. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, as the dead floated in the street and the living were stranded on highways and rooftops, a huge crowd of mostly black and poor people descended on the city's convention centre. When asked why relief organisations had, had been cut off, the hapless director of the Fed Federal Emergency Management Agency, Michael Brown, said, we're seeing people that we didn't know existed. Rarely had a true word been said. Now, the growing and political and economic <coughs> inequalities that make such a thing possible is not only replicated in journalism, but increasingly is amplified by journalism. Episodically, that amplification is shattered by the intrusion of more democratic forms of new technology, but it's never displaced. So in short, not everybody counts, and therefore not everybody is counted. We know how many US police officers are killed in the line of duty in any given year, but there's no national tally for how many people are killed by US police officers. It's revealing that as far as anyone can make out, there wasn't an increase in the number of black people being killed by the US police when Black Lives Matter started to become popular. There was just a growing awareness of a fact that already existed. So those shootings weren't news in the common sense, they weren't rare, and to the communities involved, not particularly surprising. They were news because the people who make the news couldn't ignore them anymore. As with the case with Trayvon Martin, where Facebook and Twitter smelled a rat before journalists could. It's not that the world changed. <coughs> what changed was a journalist's ability to pass off the grotesque as unremarkable. At the Ben Kinsella Trust in London, which is named after a 16-year-old boy who was stabbed to death in Islington in 2008, the manager, Patrick Green, told me, the media's response to the murder of young people is inconsistent. Some of these tragic deaths get little or no coverage. These stories are often lost because it's a busy news day or because they consider the young person to be an unworthy victim. The media are more likely to report on the murder when a bright, educated young person from a privileged background is killed, and we all think, well, how did this happen to them? We don't hear about or ask the same questions of the murders of young people from more vulnerable backgrounds. And in the absence of facts, prejudice and presumption move in. One thing that became rapidly clear when I did the series Beyond the Blade is that knife crime is a construct. It doesn't simply mean, as one might reasonably expect, crimes committed with knives. It denotes a certain type of crime committed by a certain type of criminal in a certain context. As it relates to young people, this contract, construct um, comprises several elements. The children who commit the crimes are described variously in the press as naturally violent monsters and teenage thugs who populate a section of society that is, and I quote, feral, callous, and bloodthirsty, end quote is relentlessly racialized. When we did the study Beyond the Blade, we, um, we did an analysis of the news reporting and we found that in 2016, when there was, well, no, it, it wasn't just when there were deaths, that the only time that the term knife crime was used in the national press was when it related to black boys in London. Not local press, that was different, but national press. And that has an effect. In 2007, then Prime Minister Tony Blair told an audience in Cardiff um, that we won't stop this by pretending that it isn't young black kids that are doing it. A year earlier, 
David Cameron and the opposition leader suggested in the speech that hip hop was partly responsible for youth violence. I would say to Radio One, do you realize that some of the stuff you play on Saturday nights encourages people to carry guns and knives, he said. And yet, because they said this stuff with real certainty, when we at The Guardian tried to pry the figures from the government as to who was killed and who was killing, there were no figures, or there were figures, but they wouldn't tell us what they were. And you had to wonder, for all the ink that was being spilled about knife crime, how did they know that it was young black kids doing it, or they had anything to do with hip hop? And we spent about 10 months, mostly not me, but the data journalists, making uh, freedom of information requests. And we finally got the numbers from the government as to who was being killed. And generally speaking, when the, the assailants are the same race as the victims. And what we discovered was that the overwhelming majority of kids who are killed by knives in Britain are not black. The overwhelming majority of kids in London are, but the overwhelming majority of kids in Britain aren't. And, um, and you, you begin to see how when the media starts a frame like that and they use knife crime in a certain way and then politicians then take up that frame and sometimes it's the other way around, then before you have it, you have a fact that has no basis in truth. So some things are counted and some people don't count. And even when they do count, they don't necessarily count for much. Now when I was reporting my book on gun deaths in America, there was a, the fate of one boy in particular that I was intrigued by, and that was Samuel Brightman, 16-year-old kid who was shot in South Dallas while walking down the street with his friend. And uh, it was under the headline, teen fatally shot while walking down the street. And it was one paragraph. They didn't have an awful lot to go on. But in the days to come, there was no profile of Samuel. There was no testimony from his school friends or teachers. There was no sense of who he was, let alone why he was killed. A young man was removed from the planet and he got a paragraph. And I wondered how that could be. And I found his mum. And I found out that Samuel Cordray Bradman was a sweet-tempered, fragile young man, a homebody, whose best friend was his younger sister, Whitney, who as often as not fought his battles for him. And he was just coming out of his shell, <coughs> recently been elected vice president of his school council. The women in his extended family described him alternatively as the son they never had, or the son they wished they'd had. And such was the short life whose death received such short shrift in Dallas media. I spoke to the reporter who'd written the paragraph, and to be fair, it was her task to record it, not to follow it up. So when the day was done, she handed the story over to the regular crime team, which would take up the weekend stories that they thought were worth running with. And Samuel's death didn't make the cut. And that didn't surprise the woman I spoke to. It, it would surprise very few, because Pleasant Grove, which is the area where Samuel was shot, is poor and black, and on the south side of Dallas, which is, un, uh, which is disparagingly known as Unpleasant Grove. Shootings were common there, she confirmed. People are desensitized to it. They reason that's just where bad things happen. And I heard this refrain often when talking to journalists who covered the shootings of the kids who died that day. Clearly, I was the only one who'd called them to follow up on the story. And they would very kindly rifle through their notes and tell me what they knew, and if they'd been to the crime scene, what they'd seen. And invariably, when I asked um, if they had any contact details for family members I could speak to, if there'd been any developments in the investigation, they would explain, somewhat matter-of-factly, why they had moved on. Unfortunately, said one, homicides are not uncommon in that area. Unless something unexpected happen, happened, said another, it just wouldn't be the kind of story we'd follow up on. Now, I understand that outlets have limited resources, 
Editors have to justify budgets for keeping you in a certain place or sending you back to trace each individual story, which in turn must be balanced about what other stories you might be missing if you go and do that story. Journalism is not social work. And even social workers, to be effective, have to move on at times. That said, I also know that they are little more than rationalizations for how I and other journalists exercise our relative power. We choose whose stories are told, whom we go back to, and where these resources are deployed. And those choices are not objective. They are made on the basis of what stories we subjectively consider are worthy of being told at any given time. The fact that most media outlets are commercial enterprises is of course a factor. The more a story costs, and the less likely it is to bring in readers and therefore revenue, the less likely institutions are to invest resources in it. But it's not the only factor, and generally it's not the most important. To no small extent, what the media does is rap replicate and amplify the inequalities that exist elsewhere. Journalists are more likely, both here and in America, to be white, wealthy, and educated, than the, more so than the population at large. And that means they are less likely to live in the areas where gun deaths and knife deaths happen, and less likely to know people to whom they happen to. And journalistically, this remoteness comes at a severe price. They literally don't know the people they are writing about. A, a man from the Dallas Morning News compared, he, he was a correspondent in Lebanon, and he compared covering South Dallas to being a foreign correspondent. So it's, just like a, it's like a foreign country, it's the city that he lived in. This is where the distance and the challenge of empathy comes in. Because the further you are from living in a community where a child might be murdered, the less likely you are to see it as a priority. Is victims as newsworthy or solutions as possible? Put bluntly, a child being killed is a far more newsworthy event for those who know the child than for those who don't and are never likely to. So news values are not an objective account of the most important things that have happened in any given time and place. They are the sum total of the priorities and received wisdom of those who provide the news. And those who provide the news are not a representative group. Now, what I am not saying here, and I couldn't emphasize this enough, is that the rich should not be able to write about the poor, and white people should not be able to write about black, and so on, because that way madness lies. We should never <coughs> underestimate our capacity to empathize, analyze, and engage beyond our own immediate experience. It simply recognizes, it's all I'm doing here, the distance between subject and object, the distance a journalism or organization will need to travel to remain relevant, competent, and respected. What I am saying is that in the absence of diverse newsrooms, these problems become more acute. That the point of having a critical mass of a range of different classes, ethnicities, religions, regions, and a gender balance in your newsroom isn't to make you feel good. It's not that you can then look different and act the same. That might provide photo opportunities, but not equal opportunities. I, I remember interviewing Angela Davis, the uh, African-American radical, and her talking about diversity in this moment as a difference that brings no difference and the change that brings no change. So the point isn't to look different and act the same. The point is that a truly diverse newsroom would enable news organizations to do their jobs better. And in doing their jobs better, they would find richer and more meaningful stories. Samuel's family weren't hard to find. It's just that nobody bothered to try. And this is less the product of malign neglect in journalism than the unconscious omissions born from the dead weight of power and privilege that makes the poor and the dark invisible. In short, there are places in almost every American and British city where children and teens are expected to die. Areas where the deaths of those young people don't contradict an understanding of how that city or the world should work, but confirm it. And if you raise children there, whether they are involved in criminal activity or not, then you incorporate those odds into your daily life. 
And just as Samuel's story revealed America's blind spots, so the story of the fatal stabbing of Kumari Seren Kuma Barnes in Wilsden in London revealed many of Britain's. Kumari was 15, was killed on January the 23rd, um, 2017, outside his school. He looked younger than his 15 years, and by most accounts, though, he was an old soul. He sang wailers tunes, like other kids might sing nursery rhymes. He could cook a full roast dinner for the family and stayed up all night in the 2015 general election matching the results against expectations. He was singing to himself as he left school that day only to be chased by another 15 year old boy. He ran screaming for help and shouting I'm going to get stabbed and they, that, later that evening his short life ended when one of the three stab wounds pierced a lung. His death was front page news in the London Evening Standard for two days running and received cursory coverage elsewhere in the country. The trial of his assailant came some five months later, starting just after the election. The tragedy at Grenfell happened shortly after the trial started, so there was a lot going on. Nonetheless, given the initial interest in his death, I imagine there would be considerable interest in what came of it. But it turned out that for most of the trial, only myself and a film crew doing a longer documentary were there. On the day of the verdict, there was just me and a court reporter. And this became a theme when I was doing the, um, the series on knife crime, that they would cover the death and they would cover the sentencing. And that was it. Nothing else. Nothing about what happened or who or why, or the fact that there was a youth club that had been shut down, or the struggles of the pet, no, nothing else, just, just the crime and the punishment. A few months after the verdict, after the accused had been convicted and then confessed, I managed to reach the mother of the boy who killed Kumari. I'd already spoken to Kumari's parents and written a long feature about him. And I felt that this was an important thing to do because for the most part, fatal knife crime is reduced to a crude morality play in which the young perpetrators are all but invisible. Abstracted from parents or community, we meet them in, in the dock defined by their crime. They're not children who have killed, but killers. Not people who have done something monstrous, but monsters. They stand reduced to this one act, they killed a child and their anonymity protected by law, because of that we don't see their pictures or hear from their parents. By the time the trial is over, we have no idea where they have come from, why or how, only where they're going, prison. Without face, family or friend, they are not children, they are cautionary tales. But in order to heed the caution in these tragic tales, we must first restore the humanity of those who commit them. Failing to do so is not only morally problematic, it's counterproductive. The best chance we have of sparing the next child from an early death is finding out why the last one died. And there are lots of lessons, but none can be learned if they don't start from the fact that this murder was committed by a boy, not a metaphor. Now when I found his mum, I discovered that the mother of the boy who killed Kumari had tried to get help from the child and adolescent mental health services, but he was considered uh, that he didn't meet the threshold. Um, he went to a pupil referral unit and she documented in painstaking detail requests for help that were either not answered, not met, or where the response was inadequate. She sent an email to her MP with the heading, please help me save my son. She described how the behavior of her then 13 year old son was deteriorating rapidly and he was involving himself with the wrong crowds and her fears for the impact this could have on his siblings. She detailed how she had enrolled herself in parenting classes, consulted with social workers and psychologists, sought referrals for mental health assessments, requested to move him from his school, asked for help to move her family out of London, but felt she was getting nowhere. She ended the email, all I want is for my children not to become another statistic. 
and I would like all the help possible to stop this from happening. A few months later, she warned a meeting of social workers in Bren, if we don't do something, he's either going to end up dead or someone's going to end up in a body bag. She tried. Now, we don't know if that murder could have been prevented, but we know that not everything was tried. tried. And these deaths are all too often understood as a, cult, a crisis of culture and crime, of drill and grime, while the economic and political decisions that help create the context for them go unchallenged. The cuts to everything, schools, youth clubs, mental health services, under the chronic, systemic, and systematic underfunding of our youth. In the event that the media wants to cover these stories, they hone in on the boy in the dock and the boy in the body bag. They don't seem too interested in how they got there and what might be done to prevent others destined for the same fate. As the boy in question, as his mother put it, is he responsible for his actions? Yes. Did I try everything I could? Yes. Well, we failed. Yes. The shock over Grenfell or Hurricane Katrina or the 2011 uh, riots illustrates how the media episodically discovers this daily reality in much the same way that teenagers discover sex, urgently, earnestly, voraciously and carelessly, with great self-indulgence but precious little self-awareness. They've always been aware of it, but somehow, when confronted with it, it takes them by surprise. And their surprise becomes the news. Crikey, look what I found, rather than the news itself. Goodness, look what's been going on while I've been looking elsewhere. This was painfully evident when Black Lives Matter erupted in America, in Ferguson, Missouri, when it went up in flames a few years ago. And I went to cover that. When the people rioted and looted, it was almost universal condemnation in the media, and the Department of Justice conducted a report into how the city was being run. Now, I think that any enterprising journalist could have produced the same things that were in that report themselves if they hadn't become inured to the kind of systemic discrimination that was taking place in Ferguson, where basically the local law enforcement was using its power to criminalize the black community and make them pay, literally pay, for the services in Ferguson. That's how the city was funded. So for example, between 2007 and 2014, one woman was arrested twice, spent six days in jail, and paid $550 as a result of one instance of illegal parking. One instance of illegal parking, six days in jail. She tried to pay the fine in smaller installments, $25 or $50 at a time, but the court refused to accept anything less than a full payment, and she could never afford that. And seven years after the original infraction, she still owed $541. And that was how the town raised its revenue. It was not a glitch in the system. It was the system. And then there was a 14-year-old boy who was found in an abandoned building, who was chased down by a dog, which bit his ankle and his left arm as he protected his face. The boy says officers kicked him in the head and then laughed about it afterwards. The officers say they thought he was armed. He wasn't. The Department of Justice investigators found that every time a police dog bit someone in Ferguson, that victim was black. So it turns out that sometimes dog bites man really is the story. And the media just keep on missing it. Thank you.